Hello there, this is the first video in my new playlist devoted to topic four of part one of the financial risk manager exam. And so that means I'm gonna start with an orientation to value at risk, the three approaches, which are right here, to value at risk, and how volatility plays a role. Specifically, volatility is the parameter that plays a role in the parametric approach, but that's only one of the three approaches. And that volatility as the parameter, the key question is, how do we estimate today's volatility? Now, value at risk itself is simple. It's just the quantile of a distribution. If we have something like a normal distribution, value at risk, as a risk measure, is interested in what are the bad things that can happen over here in the one tail that represents the downside for us. So the value at risk is just a feature of a distribution. And then what's more difficult is the approaches to generating the quantile. And we say broadly there are three approaches. Parametric, which is also called analytical. We have historical simulation and Monte Carlo simulation. You'll notice I've colored these two in green because they're both simulations. So I sometimes think of them as two approaches, but classically we say there are these three approaches where on an exam, for example, in the FRM, the parametric approach is popular because it's so simple to use and it's betrayed by Greek Sigma, which indicates volatility or standard deviation. So for example, if we know that the daily standard deviation of let's say an asset or a portfolio is 1%, we would denote that sigma equals 1%. And then if we further made a brazen assumption that the returns are normally distributed, then we might say something like we have a 95% confidence that that daily value at risk or normal value at risk is equal to, well, we would take our sigma and multiply it by the uh, Z value or normal Z value given some level of confidence or significance. The 95%, the quantile associated with 95% is 1.645. So we would take 1% and multiply it by 1.645, and we would get 1.645% as the 95% confident normal VAR for this asset that has a volatility of 1%. And so this normal linear or parametric approach to value risk, very simple, and I sometimes say it's just a multiplier of volatility or just scales volatility taking that sigma, multiplying by the quant, the standard normal quantile that's associated with our confidence level. So if we wanted more confidence, we might have 99% confidence. We would use a 2.33 here instead because that's the quantile that's returned by the standard normal cumulative distribution function, or that's the area under that bell curve. Now that's just one of maybe the easiest under the class of parametric approaches. And there's a whole universe of parametric approaches, but you'll notice what we don't have here is a, is what I call messy data, right? It's uh, parsimonious or efficient, and it also can be quick. So that parametric or analytical approach is in contrast to the simulation approaches, which basically generate or use data. That's the big difference. Here we have a clean function and don't get me wrong, data will inform the parameters. Historical data informs that parameter, but once we're done with the data, we throw the data away, then we just have parameters and a clean function. As opposed to historical simulation, well I think that's sort of betrayed by a histogram. And if you think about histogram, histograms are messy data. And we really just take the history of returns, sort them, and then look for the worst. But that's also just looking for the quantile of a distribution that happens to be empirical as opposed to parametric. The Monte Carlo simulation also uses uh, messy data. The only difference here is whether than going back into history, it generates its own data set, having some model 
that presumes to be able to generate this forward-looking data set. And I think the Monte Carlo simulation approach is betrayed by the random number generator because the Monte Carlo simulation needs a function, an engine, to describe the behavior of the asset or portfolio. But then, given that, importantly, it needs a random number generator to make up this fake data, if you will. We hope the fake data is good at projecting into the future. Okay, so before I drill down on the parametric, just wanted to quickly overlay a typology that would be that would be familiar to those students of who are studying risk formally under the FRM, and that's where the risk measures are divided into local valuation or full revaluation. The reason I wanted to do that is to show simply that it's compatible with those three approaches or those two approaches, depending on how you look at it. Local valuation includes those familiar models where we lean on something like the mean variance framework and a covariance matrix to be very familiar with if you're working with portfolios. So we're assuming that assets in the portfolio have volatilities and then pairwise correlations to each other. That's the covariance matrix. You're probably working in the local valuation and it's a parametric approach and it's efficient. We can deal with large portfolios very efficiently. As opposed to, do we go into a full revaluation and fully reprice? And for example, right here would be a bootstrap historical simulation. We take historical returns, apply them to a current portfolio, and we go and fully reprice the portfolio. In theory, this would be more time consuming, but maybe more accurate. Stress testing would probably be a full revaluation in Monte Carlo as well. So I just want to show that that maps fairly cleanly to that our three approaches of parametric and uh, simulation. And okay, so this is my first overview in topic four of part one FRM, where the topic really is called risk models and valuation. And we start with value at risk. And I've already said that we have three basic approaches to value at risk. And then... That first reading in this for FRM candidates is uh, quantifying volatility in value risk. And so we know that a challenge is, wait, what's the relationship between value risk and volatility? Okay, so that's why I'm doing the overview because we have three approaches to the value risk and the parametric or analytical then, our most common here is to go into parametric volatility where we're trying to first answer the question of what is the appropriate estimate for current volatility? And see, I'm trying to write a Greek sigma to denote, I maybe should put a little N there to distinguish between N minus one or minus two, today's volatility estimate. That becomes very important. So the volatility then is at least as our, in our first step here, our volatility is gonna be our most important probably, parameter in the parametric approach. And so if I go just one more, then I have a diagram that tries to address that volatility as the key parameter in the parametric approach, where we have lots of different, a whole menu of choices, but my diagram here tries to just reduce this to its essence. And remember, we're trying to, we want to go parametric now, and we want to say, we want to answer the question, what's our best estimate for today's volatility? And that's a more profound question than it seems because here's something philosophical. Volatility is, has no instantaneous existence. Unlike asset price, we can look that up. Volatility is actually a measure that requires a time series or some other assumptions. Has no instantaneous existence, yet we're trying to estimate the volatility today and actually going forward. So what I have here is this first sort of gating question. Are we using historical returns to inform our estimate of today's volatility? You notice I do have a choice here. We can say, no, let's not do that. Let's use implied volatility, which is profoundly convenient, but requires us to have two things a pricing model, and here's the other thing we sometimes don't have, a traded or observed price. The most common instance here, application here, is 
the implied volatility for an option, right? If, if we have a model, Black-Scholes option pricing model, and if we have traded prices for the options, then we can, the, we can use the traded prices, which are normally outputs in the model, to reverse engineer what implied volatility would solve for those observed prices. And so we can retrieve an implied volatility without any data. All of the information comes from the traded price. Super elegant and sensible, but well, oftentimes we don't have the price. Okay, now if we do use historical returns, you notice here I have a yes. And then the key question here becomes, how do we weight historical returns? And our most common approach here is we weight them equally. Or that's when you see computations or discussions of standard deviation as volatility. Most often it's equal. And sometimes it's implicit because it's unweighted. But even if it's unweighted, it's implicitly equal. So that formula is shown right here, where in the perhaps familiar to you formula for an estimate of today's variance, I have sigma squared subscript of n to denote today. And oftentimes it's easier to just deal with the variance knowing that we just take the square root to get the volatility, right? In this context, volatility is a synonym with standard deviation. So then I have here what I think is the most elegant and easiest formula for today's estimate of variance. It's the historical standard deviation where all of the squared returns are getting the same weight. Here we have the returns. They are squared. It's over some historical window going back M days, probably M periods, really, but probably M days. And so this formula is so convenient that we can actually describe it very easily in words. And here I'm going to describe it in words now. The estimate for today's variance is the average squared return. Very simple, right? Taking the squared return divided by M because we're making a couple of simplifications. We're assuming that the average return in that series is zero and we're dividing by M instead of M minus one. I've covered those technical nuances in my earlier playlist in our topic two. Those are quantitative topics. But for now, this is fine as an estimator of today's variance. And it, ha it is simple, but it has one glaring weakness, at least we think in finance, and that is all of the returns are getting the same weight. So if M is 250 for 250 trading days of the past year, then you'll notice yesterday's return is getting the same weight as the return one year ago. And generally, we don't like that. Generally, we think yesterday's return should have more weight. So you notice I go here. How do we weight the historical returns? Well, let's give more weight to more recent returns, right? That's the next step in, up in sophistication. And you notice I have a box here for Arch 1.1. That's the fancy term for the very broad class of models here that have the flexibility of weighting this return. And actually all it really does is add a little alpha weight here and lets us customize the weights applied to the returns. However, I'm concerned with a subclass within Arch M that really is Garch 1.1 and exponentially weighted moving average. Here's the Garch 1.1. After anyone studying this will become familiar with it eventually. And the thing about the both of the models in this box is that they give more weight to recent returns. And in fact, it's specifically an exponentially declining weight. So the weight's in constant proportion. Both weights. Yes, that's true of Garch as well. Math is not so difficult to show. So the Garch 1-1 one, one we have here. And then you'll notice it's a, it's a special case of the Arch 1-1. Then if I just take the weight assigned to the long run or unconditional variance, and that weight here happens to be denoted Greek uh, gamma. And if I give it zero weight, then that cancels. And the Garch 1-1 in general collapses collapses to the exponentially weighted moving average. And so I'm rounding off a little bit here, making some simplifications, but we could say the exponentially weighted moving average is a special case of Garch 1-1, or Garch 1-1 generalizes the exponentially weighted moving average. Both share in common this, this feature that 
more recent weights get greater return and in fact they decline exponentially. And you can see here in the model the beta in GAR211 maps to lambda in the exponential weighted moving average as does alpha to the 1 minus lambda term. But that's the feature of these two models, this class of the arch, arch M. And then, so what do these two have in common, or what do these have in common really? Well, the weighting of the returns is a function of time. More recent gets greater weight. Here we have no discrimination in the weighting of the returns. And so that's why finally here I have the third sort of a approach to volatility as the key parameter in the parametric approach to VAR. And here we have similarity to economic state. And I'm just being very conceptual here. Here's the kernel function, but this is described in the first reading that's assigned to FRM candidates. And here the variance also has squared returns, but now it's not a function of time. Rather, there is a vector of key variables, and perhaps these are macroeconomic variables, for example, um, the interest rate term structure or GDP growth. And we have a vector of variables and we say what we describe today in terms of those vectors, what does the term structure look like today? And then each day in the window we go back and compare the state of those variables. And so it's a comparison of vectors. If, and we may go back to, to 30 days ago and find then in terms of comparing the vector of our variables, 30 days ago was very different, so it gets a low weight. We may go back a year and find that in terms of our, the variables in our vector, it's very similar to today, and we give it a higher weight. So you see how in the kernel function, it's not about time, which is sort of a simple rule. It's more, it's customized per, via our kernel function to the similarity of the past to today. So that makes a lot of logical sense, I think. And so that's the schematic in terms of, again, the parametric volatility, all of which gets to that single question, what's the best estimate of today's volatility, or if you like, today's variance? And in turn, In turn, that parametric volatility is a parameter in our parametric approach, which is just one of the three approaches to value at risk, right? These are all value at risk approaches. Okay, so that's a summary overview of the introduction to topic four in part one of the FRM. If you like the video, please uh, subscribe to the channel and you'll be notified of our updates. Thank you.